Okay, so greetings everyone. Um, welcome to our first spring semester um, med school presentation. We're glad to have NYU here with us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and allow Dr. Rivera to introduce himself and his team. And um, thank you, there you go. Thank you, sir. So hi everyone, I'm Rafael Rivera. I am the Associate Dean for Admissions and Financial Aid here at NYU Grossman. I'm also a pediatric radiologist. I just finished reading cases for this afternoon. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by three of our students um, who I will ask uh, them to introduce themselves now, starting uh, with Miranda. Hi, everyone. My name is Miranda. I use she, her pronouns. I am currently a third year medical student. I graduated from Hopkins in 2019. So it's been quite a few years since I've uh, been there, but I am post-clerkships, post-preclinical, and probably applying into pediatrics. Uh, and then next, uh, I'll ask Lucas to introduce himself. Hey everyone, I'm Lucas. I'm a first year med student here at NYU. I graduated from Hopkins in 2022, and I'm interested in plastic surgery. And last, but most certainly not least, uh, Brian. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Brian. I graduated from Hopkins in 2020. Um, I am a first-year medical student in the uh, MD-PhD program at NYU, um, and I'm interested in something neuro-related. Not sure what quite yet, but in that realm. All right. Thank you. So, you know, you, you've got us for about an hour. Uh, I've got some slides that I'm happy to show. It, it's basically sort of a subset of the slides that I showed to our accepted uh, students just a couple of weeks ago when we had our first look event. Um, but before I, I go into that, uh, I'm just going to ask folks. I, I know folks like to be sort of uh, a bunch of black tiles, but, I, you know, it's a little disconcerting to be speaking to a bunch of black tiles. So I would love if folks can, right, uh, turn your cameras on. Obviously, if you can't do that, in a, you know, if you're in a a uh, private spot or something. But, you know, I, I love to do in the in-person campus visits because I can see people, I can shake people's hands. Um, and so it would be nice to have some of that if people can feel that they can turn their cameras. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna ask uh, Miranda, you can if you can help me coordinate our questions as they come through. But I'm just gonna start real briefly with uh, just showing, um, let's, let's go with this guy. do this and so all right uh can folks see my slide deck okay all right so i'm just going to talk a little bit about the the school some of the things that differentiate us maybe from other medical schools um starting with what our mission is right and, and our mission right uh, each year we go through thousands of applications i think i'll show you on the next slide to to recruit and matriculate the, the most academically talented interpersonally gifted and broadly diverse student body to NYU Grossman, right? The student body that we believe will thrive in our culture of excellence here at NYU Grossman and at NYU Langone Health, and that we believe will go on to become the future leaders and scholars for all segments of our patient population. So that's a pretty lofty goal, uh, but we do that every year. That, that's what we uh, look through applications. And last year we had over 8,400 applicants, uh, which reflected about a 1% increase from the year over last year. Uh, and that was favorable given, I think, nationally applications decreased by about two, two and a half percent nationally across the country. I mean, we, we peaked uh, in that post, uh, that 2020, 21 COVID cycle, and then have been sort of dropping uh, thereafter. When uh, when students apply to us, uh, when they interview with us, as many of you uh, uh, may, you know, I'll chat with you all. I, I'll see you all on your interview day. And you'll hear me talking about this spreadsheet approach that I, I believe is the best way to identify which, best, uh, which school is the best fit for you. I will start off by saying every U.S. medical school is a great school, right? You can't go wrong with any. You just have to identify what the best fit for you is. Um, and so what I ask, folks to do is to do a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, searching of the heart, their brain, if you will, to identify what are the different parameters that are uniquely important to them and putting that down in a spreadsheet, identifying what the weighting of all those things, you can figure out what the best fit for you is. I can go on there if people have more questions, but in the interest of time, 
these are the six things that I have found typically are on most people's spreadsheets. The most common thing I've seen over the last 15 years or so is the first one, right? The, uh, the ranking of the school, the reputation of the school. Uh, and I'll talk briefly about that, but I will say that that is the one factor of all of these that actually has by far the least impact on your future career trajectory. And I'll talk about that uh, in, in a bit more. Geography matters to folks, right? That's um, uh, one of the top three items uh, in addition to reputation. Geography matters a lot to folks in terms of where they want to go to medical school, both from the perspective of what it has on uh, the inf impact it has on your medical education, the patients that you will see, things of that sort, but also where you want to be living for the next three, four, five plus years thereafter. I'll talk about that as well. And then the third uh, in the top three factors, and they vary based on the order for each individual person, but that's financial value at the bottom. And that is an area where we uh, excel significantly. I'll talk about that. And rounding out the top six, curricular options, right? Opportunities to, to tailor your education to suit your unique interests. And then the strength of the clinical training and the strength of the research. Those are the six that I found to be on most people's list. And so here's how we fare on those things, right? So rankings. Um, I will say I am a huge fan of rankings um, in the sense that if there was an ideal ranking, a ranking would be um, a great way to add to an individual student's decision-making process, so long as that ranking had these four things on it, right? So the ranking would have to be based on data that is objective, that you can verify where the source of the data comes from, verify the actual data, and had a consistent methodology year in and year out that was not subject to the whims of the publisher in this case. Two, the factors that they looked at would be relevant to consumers, in this case, students going to medical school. Three, very important, you'd be able to tailor the rankings to individualize it to suit your needs, right? I can say what the best car is, I can come up with a rankings for that, but there's no way that that best car ranking, for example, would apply to everyone. And four, very importantly, you would identify how those schools, how those parameters that you assess those schools, how that contributes to a quantifiable benefit to students. So if there was a ranking that could do all four of these things, I'd be a huge fan. But the fact of the matter is, the US News and World Report ranking fails on all of these criteria. I think the US News and World Report ranking is garbage. I thought that, I've said that since uh, I took on this role in 2009, 2010. I've been saying that the whole way through. I said it when we were ranked two for a couple of years. It's meaningless. There is no, uh, uh, and I can talk a lot more about Weizmann in this, uh, and uh, starting here, for example, right? You could look at the subjective factors that are on it. Um, basically, you're asking people to vote for themselves. And my analogy here is, uh, imagine if you were to ask burger manufacturers to rate themselves on who makes the best burger. So if I, what do you think the CEO of McDonald's is going to vote? You think they're going to say Wendy's makes a better burger than them? No. So you kind of ask those folks, you got to ask like the students or ideally maybe the resident party directors, that's a little bit better. But so that's number one garbage. Two of the selectivity metrics, I think that that has an impact uh, that I would keep in there because it does give you a sense of the academic capabilities of the incoming class, um, but it doesn't have to be so uh, highly weighted as, as it has been in the past. Research funding, right? Am I saying research is important for medical schools? Yes, but you got to remember at an academic medical center, we have three missions. Arguably the one that takes most of our time is our clinical mission. Research mission is vitally important as well. And the third is education, right? So those are our three missions. Every academic medical center has them. But to, to rank, to, to base almost half of your ranking on the amount of research funding is inherently flawed. And I'm gonna show you why in that last slide. And then the same thing for faculty numbers, right? Showcasing that if you have more faculty, that's going to give you a better experience. We all know that that's not uh, necessarily the case. And then look at what they omit, right? So there's no sense of how the school trains you academically, right? So one low hanging fruit is how people do on their USMLE medical licensing exams. That's an important figure. For example, if you're applying a competitive residency, you want to know that you can do well if the school prepares you to do well on that area. Financial value, right? It boggles my mind that they don't include any measure of the financial aid or the value of an individual institution in terms of long-term earnings. It's incredibly simple to do that. You can ask yourself why they don't include that. 
and arguably the biggest omission is the strength of their clinical training, right? Folks applying to medical school are applying because you want to be doctors, right? So why would you not include a measure of the training that occurs at an institution, looking at multiple proxies that tell you about the training, specifically all of the outcome measures that they themselves look at in the U.S. News uh, Hospital Ranking System and other entities do a much better job in, like Vizient, for example. So I have the GIGO acronym off top there because basically what this means is garbage in, garbage out. So if you look at these garbage metrics, you can't pay any attention to these rankings. And again, I've been saying this for 15 years now. And I would argue that U.S. News and World Report would have to change all these factors and ultimately change the ranking from a research ranking to an academic ranking, recognizing that, again, we have those three clinical missions. So again, research funding, important to some extent, yes, but not 50% importance. When you look at the physician workforce, less than 1% of physicians include research as a major activity. So I would argue that that research weighting is over exampled, and most people are in clinical practice, so you have to include that. And then financial aid, as I'll talk about in a couple slides, right? How can you not include a measure of financial value? Because that, as we have seen, is a key driver in students' decisions. Geography. I think New York City is a great place. There are a lot of great places in, New York, in the U.S. You have to identify what the best place for you is. To me, um, when I look at a city in terms of where I'd want to be, granted, I will say up front, I'm biased. Right? I'm from New York. I grew up here. I think it's a fantastic place to be. I love it particularly because it's a very um, dense area. There's a ton of opportunities within a small spot. You don't need a car to get around. If you're a foodie like I was when I was younger, so many opportunities, right? You could eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner at a different spot every day. You wouldn't hit the same spot twice, what, the, what people say. If you're in the entertainment, right? You, you want to go to see Broadway shows. You want to go to the museums. You want to go to the Philharmonic, whatever that may be, concerts, uh, jazz halls, right? Uh, house clubs. Again, I, I don't know of any place in, this, in the country that is better uh, than New York City. There are different spots. Um, and in terms of safety, right, it is one of the safer large cities, though, of course, it, there's been an increase in time uh, across nationally. So so that that's tremendous. And in terms of the city, we we um, I think we have uh, probably the best location. We're right smack in the center of Midtown. We're right on the east uh, on the east uh, river there, uh, which is great for getting around town. You can get there's an extensive shuttle service, ferry service that gets you around. So that's a particularly great thing. But I would argue that as a medical student, Probably the best benefit that we have uh, is that not only are we in New York City, which is probably the most diverse patient population in the country. Um, and when I mean diverse, I mean from an international perspective, right? You're talking about folks, not just from the Asia Pacific market, South America, Africa, Europe, you name it. Um, but we have a hospital mix that is unparalleled and that allows you to see every segment of that diverse patient population. So we've got six plus, right, uh, hospitals, right, that you can rotate through um, that, uh, as I will probably just briefly mention in a slide uh, down the road, um, provide the absolute best clinical outcomes of any hospital in the country. Um, and I could talk about that with anybody who's interested. Uh, Bellevue Hospital, the country's premier uh, public hospital, um, and the Manhattan VA, right, on 23rd Street. So you're going from 34th to 23rd, you've got these three hospitals where you will see private, public, and government hospital settings and every patient demographic that exists in New York. That is a tremendous asset and it's a tremendous benefit to the research that people do. Let's talk curriculum. And I'm trying to go through these quickly enough so that we have time to ask, ask me and our students any questions you like. I used to think, I used to like uh, say that the curricular options were not a major reason to choose one school over the other, whether you did a you know, a, a one and a half year or one year pre-clerkship curriculum, I didn't think it mattered all that much because to be honest, for like the basic science years, for example, you, you, you'd learn the same materials using the same digital slide decks, right? Anki, so you, you can ask students. So you pretty much learn the same thing thereafter. What matters is the clinical experience that we talked about in the last slide, and I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a subsequent section. But more importantly, what I found matters a lot is the curricular options that you have to accelerate your training uh, and to link to certain dual degrees. And so um, starting with this last entering class, 
every single one of our students now can graduate in three years and have multiple different options ahead of them. So they can choose to apply broadly to any residency in the country. They can apply to our three-year program that we have had in place since 2013. Right, so we've been um, uh, graduating medical students in three years for uh, over a decade now. And uh, one of the beauties of that program is that acceptance to that program comes with a guaranteed acceptance into any one of our 21 plus residency programs. Or you can do medical school in three years and then do a dual degree research or research here in four years. And of course, if you're an MD, PhD applicant, this also saves one year from your combined degree. So any way you slice and dice it, you will get to where you want to be one year earlier. There's a significant financial value. So here's one option that students can choose, right? So you'll have the one year pre-clerkship uh, period of instruction that our students can talk extensively about. You got one year of clerkships and then you have your third year where you would do everything you typically would do in your fourth year, take a step to the, the boards, applying, doing away rotations, right? And applying to the NRMP process and then finding out where you match. Uh, typically, I think it's the second Friday uh, of March. So that's one option. Uh, two is the one that has direct uh, progression into any one of our NYU Langone Health residences. And you can join this pathway at multiple time points, starting before you even set foot on campus, right? As a pre-matriculated student, you can apply then. You can again apply at the end of your first year or at the end of your second year, if you so choose, uh, to the 21 plus residency programs that we have. Here are the, the different options that we have. We don't limit folks to any specific set of residency programs like primary care programs, the way I think some schools may. But uh, we pretty much offer, I think, every single program that's on there. One that's not on here is a combined psychiatry neurology residency program that we do also offer, but that one has a slot. I think it only opens every third year, so given the joint nature between the two programs. And then you have the option of doing a research year or doing a dual degree year. So you can get any of these dual degrees. Uh, for example, you can get your uh, MBA, you can get your MPH, your MPA, and we've got two new ones, right? Well, the, the, really the one big new one, the biomedical informatics one, looking at machine learning, AI, uh, using technology for education and clinical care. That's gotten very, very popular over the years. You can do all of these in a year so that you are done with both your MD and your master's degree in four years. Same thing for you. So that's, that is tremendous. And then... The last option is if you do that, if you do a dual degree of research here, you can still apply to the uh, directed residency pathway by opt-in three. You would apply during that third that third year when you're doing the research year or the dual degree year, and then find out if you've gotten into plastics or peds or whatever that may be. So this is an area that I think very, very few other schools do, uh, especially with the number of options that we provide. So that is a major asset to us. Clinical training, right? Um, when you look at every uh, every rank uh, system that's out there, right? They they all vary to some degree in terms of utility. The best one is Visient Data because that that data um, they collect tons of data from pretty much every academic medical center and nearly every private slash community hospital out there. And so they look at a whole host of data focusing on patient outcomes, patient satisfaction measures. Um, and on that one, we are far and away number one for both inpatient and outpatient care. Uh, U.S. News and World Report, uh, again, I, I don't know what's up with them. Uh, this year, they made 100 hospitals, I think, number one. Everyone went, how can that be? I just, it's, it's, it, it just is not the case. And when you look at the differences in terms of things like observed to expected mortality ratios, um, I, as you can calculate in business data, there are significant differences there. But we're also the only A-rated hospital system in New York, um, and that is across our entire inpatient and outpatient enterprise, right? So in some places, they list only the mothership uh, and then give that grade. Um, but here, um, we pride ourselves on providing excellent care no matter where you go to any one of our hospitals. So we don't, we don't slap our name on a hospital and call it a day. So for example, when we took over NYU Langone, Brooklyn, right? Uh, used to be called Lutheran Hospital. I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn. Um, the outcomes, uh, the care was not awesome. I can speak to that personally as, as, as a patient back then. When we took them on, 
Um, our numbers dipped in terms of the uh, quality that we're providing based on the accumulation of their outcomes. But in three short years, with uh, you know putting our our systems in place, having faculty from here uh, uh, basically you know take over certain areas of the hospital, the outcomes in NYU Langone Brooklyn are the same as a mothership in New York, and that says a lot because the patient catchment area for NYU Langone Brooklyn serves the highest concentration of Medicaid patients in the country, right? So the fact that we can give excellent care and the same thing with regards to our, our institution in Manhattan, it's been widely uh, published and, and, and publicized that uh, underrepresented minority communities fared uh, much less well uh, with regards to the COVID epidemic, right? With, with blacks and Hispanics dying at higher rates uh, than non-black or non-Hispanic patients but not here, right? And we were together with our other New York City hospitals, we were ground zero when COVID hit us back in 2020. But despite that, we found for our patients, there was no difference in outcomes, whether you were black, Hispanic, Asian, white, you name it, right? Um, and that's a testament to our approach to health equity, which is to ensure that there is excellence in all aspects of our training so that everyone gets the top level. So that's something I'm happy to talk a lot more about. Research opportunities, any one of the top 10, top 20 ranked schools will provide more than enough research opportunities for an individual student to exhaust uh, during multiple lifetimes in medical school. Um, but what I will say is when you look at how productive our faculty members are, right? We may be on the smaller side from a hospital, but we are incredibly productive. In fact, we've been for several years now, the most productive institution with regards to the amount of NIH uh, awards and the funding of those awards per researcher when you look at all the medical schools. You can see our listing here. And, and again, the largest amount of uh, funds per PI with the smallest number of PIs, right? Showcasing how um, productive and how successful uh, the research team, the science team has been at encouraging and supporting scientists uh, in terms of their ability to conduct research and apply for those grants. And again, on any measure that you look at, the, the trajectory of the institution, the, these are the same things that we see with regards to the trajectory of our clinical mission, the trajectory of our education mission, uh, and the trajectory of the school, if you will, on those rankings anyway. So all of these things showcase how much better we've done with regards to recruiting top research faculty from across the country, getting active awards and annual submissions. All these things have increased. And again, I'm happy to talk about a lot more down the road. Financial value. I would argue nobody does this better than we do, right? In 2018, we became the first medical school to offer tuition-free scholarships to every student. Every medical student would, who was accepted would automatically get, at a minimum, the full cost of tuition covered with a scholarship, which roughly is about 65000 give or take, and easily two-thirds of the cost of attendance for folks. And then in 2021, if I'm remembering correctly, we became the first school in the country to be a tuition-free and debt-free school. And what that means is, yes, everybody continues to get the tuition-free scholarships, but on top of that, if you have financial need that exceeds the cost of tuition, we will meet all of your financial need with scholarships as opposed to loans, up to the full cost of attendance. And then that later that same summer, we also announced that we would cover the individual health insurance plan premiums for all of our medical students, roughly a five to $7,000 value in and of itself, and yeah, New York City is an expensive place to live, um, but we thankfully subsidize our apartments to the point where I think on average, uh, our students pay somewhere around 1400 bucks a month uh, for apartments, uh, shared apartments uh, on 26th and 1st. Is 1400 bucks a month a lot? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. But compared to what people pay in New York City and Midtown, nah, not even close. Um, so with all those things, right, you know, we're, we're huge data pack rats, so we, we hold on to everything. And you can see that over the years, right, we, we put tuition free into effect in 2018, right? And you can see how much the, uh, the, the drop in dentists has been. This doesn't include the latest year because we don't have comparative data to compare to. But I will say that for the, the graduating class of 23, their average debt was lower still at about 75,000. And those numbers don't even apply to you because as a student coming through Grossman now, again, all medical school is done in three years, the average debt for our three-year graduates is somewhere around 55 to 60,000. And only 29% of our students have any debt, meaning 71% have zero debt. 
And then when you look at the distribution of our debt, right? I'm very proud of all this, right? We, we, this, is a, this is a great thing we've, we've done. And I, I just is probably the thing I'm most proud of uh, that we've done um, uh, together over the last um, 17 years. You can see in 2018, before we went tuition free, the distribution uh, of, of the indebtedness of our graduating class and the, the, the size of the, the histogram bar shows you how many students uh, were having that level of debt that you can see on the side. And look at how over the years, you've seen a progressive decrease in the absolute size of those bars and then a shift upwards uh, such that nobody uh, has you know, the excess debt you see at other schools where one out of every five private medical school graduates has over $300,000 that we don't have anywhere near. And something, I don't expect anybody to see this, uh, but if there are any finance majors in the group, all of that doesn't even touch the financial value that our students have from accelerating their education, either by way of our three-year with directed residency pathways, our three-year with national applications broadly, or even the dual degree, because in every one of those instances, you save one additional year of your life. You get into practice one additional year. And that provides you with an additional year of physician level salary under your belt that we're working with our finance team to take a look at what the net present value of that is over going to a school that's for So, So here we've taken away the impact of tuition free and debt free scholarships because we're comparing this, our students here who've gone to school in three years versus our students who've gone to four years. So they'll have gotten the same tuition free scholarships. The only difference here is the time to degree. And you can see when you look at a 10 year horizon or a 20 or 30 year horizon, the delta between doing medical degree in three versus four years continues to grow. And that's because again, you not only have that additional year of physical level earnings, but at every year thereafter, whenever you get that yearly pay raise, if you will, you have an additional incremental or you would have been to start. And so that's 500,000 in today's dollars um, in terms of the value going to a three years of to four. So that is pretty sensible. But I'm going to finish by saying our ultimate secret to our excellence, if you will, is our commitment to creating a culture of excellence that starts with the people, the mission, and the culture that we have. Right, starting with Dr. Robert Grossman, uh, who has been our dean and CEO since 2007. I love the guy. He's uh, like me. He grew up dirt poor. And so it was his vision. It was his desire to make us a tuition-free school. And what we didn't have in an endowment uh, when he started in 2007, I believe we may have had $15 million in scholarship and just peanuts, uh, but we didn't have in that. We had grit and tenacity. We just kept chipping away at it. Thanks to Grace Poe and her team, you know, we ended up raising some 700 plus million dollars to be able to offer this for folks. I think that says a lot about the school and about the teacher. So um, I'm just going to leave that. And now I'm going to ask our students, um, starting with Miranda, uh, and then Lucas and then Brian to talk, um, to give a little bit more detail about what, what their fine. experience. Yeah, what their experience has been at, at Hopkins when they were applying to medical schools, the things that they were looking for, and then why you chose NYU, what the experience has been uh, for you medical school today, starting with Miranda. Okay, so like I said, I'm a like I said, I'm a third year medical student. I graduated Hopkins in 2019. Um, I took two gap years. Um, and during those gap years, I worked as a medical assistant at a dermatology practice back home, lived with my parents, saved money. Um, and I applied um, kind of right during the COVID like quarantine period. So my application process was uh, odd because I had a lot of time to work on my application and prepare essays and things of that sort since I wasn't working. Um, but I was also kind of like one of those first classes who was who was interviewing virtually, which was uh, its own challenge. Um, and. I didn't really have an opportunity to see any of the schools that I was applying to in person. Um, one of the reasons I chose NYU was the financial benefit that was significant for me, um, but also the proximity to my family. 
and I'm originally from Philadelphia and um, I like to say that I, I really like my two hour radius. So I went to Baltimore. Um, it was very easy for me to get to and from my parents' house. Um, and being in New York, I was hesitant at first. Um, I was honestly scared that everywhere was going to be Times Square. And fortunately, it is not. Um, it's so much more fun than any other city that I've lived in. Um, and, you know, there's just always something to do, which I really appreciate um, about that. So did I answer all the questions? Did I miss anything? No, I think that's good. And, you know, okay. we'll, I'm sure folks will ask you guys questions individually and you can go for them. So then Lucas and then Brian. Yeah, so my application process, I'm very thankful that it was, I'd say, smooth. I graduated actually in December 2021 and started the whole application process around that time. So I was graduated for, for pretty much all of it. Um, I worked in Baltimore for that semester, the spring 2022 semester, and then went back home to Puerto Rico for all of my gap year where I did research and had a part-time job and it was really great. Uh, I think the most important thing for me throughout the whole application process was to really stay on top of it and try to maximize um, just my productivity and being sure that I would submit everything as soon as it opened. If I got a secondary application within two weeks, I would I would send it back. I submitted the primary the day of. And those are small things that I think do go a long way in really maximizing your chances of getting into a great school. Uh, and then when it came, when it was time to decide between schools, I think the biggest reasons that drew me to NYU were first of all, the price, the, the financial, the financial aspect of, of it all was super important to me and NYU is the best option for that. Second to that, the three-year option is huge because even if you don't end up going to residency in three years, you can still use that extra year to do what you wanna do as opposed to have to subscribe to something that's predetermined. So I thought that was a really great option and something that we haven't really talk, talked about today is just a really good sense of community that we have at NYU. Uh, and I think the biggest, re or one of the biggest reasons for that is that most of all of our students live in the same building, which really helps, especially for first and second year, where even if you're taking all the classes together, it's really nice to just come together in the afternoons or walk together to class or just whenever you want to go grab a bite or something, you can just go with your friends and meet in the lobby downstairs. It's really easy. Um, should I answer some of the questions in the chat? No, you know what we'll do? We'll uh, we'll hand off to Brian, and then Miranda will uh, sort of delegate the questions, and we'll answer them. Uh, we can answer them by tech typing, or we could also just speak to them, so that way everybody can hear that. All right. So Sweet. then we'll uh, we'll go with Brian. Thank you, Louis. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, I think a lot of things that Lucas said, I can echo. Uh, as well, in terms of the application, um, it was pretty smooth, and I, I really, I actually really enjoyed writing the the secondary uh, questions for for NYU, which I didn't quite expect. But um, uh, compared to some other schools, I, I did. Um, in terms of picking uh, a location to go to school, I think that was more. I was pretty high on my on my docket because. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm the MSTP, so I'll be, I was signing up for you know seven or eight years in one place. So it was really important for me to figure out if I like the city that uh, I would be studying at. Um, and if I'm going to be honest, uh, initially I didn't want to come to New York. Um, you know, I had grown up in suburbs my entire life, and as everyone knows, in uh, Hopkins, Baltimore, it's not the biggest city. There are definitely it's more on the peaceful side, uh, and I definitely enjoyed that. Um, so I was uh, kind of afraid of what the size of uh, of a place like New York would be. Um, but I can say after spending, you know, close to a year here now, um, it is 
incredibly rewarding to be able to uh, just walk out of your apartment and do stuff, I guess. Um, things aren't closed really early at night and, and it's really easy to take a step back away from the study and from the grind uh, and, and maybe just take a moment for yourself and your friends. Uh, and that really wasn't something uh, that, yeah, so I, I'd spent a year after graduating at Hopkins and gap year, and it, it was just a little bit more difficult to find those little nooks and pockets to, to kind of escape to. Um, and it took a little bit more searching, but in New York, it's everywhere. Right. And I think that's, that was an important aspect that, that I, and why I really grew to like uh, living here. Great. Awesome. Great perspectives. Um, and just a, just a caveat, right? So the tuition free scholarships don't apply to the MSDP students because MSDP students across the country get everything covered, right? They get a full stipend, uh, they get everything covered, and they have a stipend. But, uh, but still, the curricular benefits uh, definitely do. And then I think one point Brian mentioned, you know, you talked about geography. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, as great as I think New York is, it's not the best fit for everybody, right? It's a good fit for a lot of people, but not everybody. So you really got to know yourself, know what sort of environment you look for, which is why that's spreadsheet, right? So the, the approach that I recommend for folks is just spend, the, especially before you start applying, right? Spend about an hour or two, right? Definitely reach out to the pre-health advisors at Hopkins. They are great. They will be able to, to provide you information, especially in terms of how Hopkins students fare across, but, but definitely reach out to them. And then once you've done that, spend some time with yourself identifying what are all the things you could possibly be thinking of in terms of a decision and what might be important for you. I would take all those things and sort of like stream of consciousness, I put them in column A of an Excel spreadsheet. And then once those are all done, I'd go back to them and in column B, a sign of waiting to all of those. Recognizing that not all the things are equally important. Some things are gonna be, so for somebody, geography may be very important. For somebody else, financial aid may be important. The threat of the clinical training, for example. But go through all of those things. And you may find that there are certain things that you put on the list that you're like, oh, that's not really that important to take it off. Or the things that you hadn't thought about go on there. And it's sort of like a living document. You're going to want to do that after you've gone through the MSAR and after you've met with the pre-health advisors. You can start pulling schools on there so you can score them. But as you apply and interview these schools, you'll learn more about, like, for example, you may learn about, you know, the difference in the culture at schools. That's very important. And so then you would score folks on that. So i um, happy to talk about that uh, with anybody who has questions. But then, Miranda, you uh, you have the floor. So uh, uh, take over with the questions and shoot them at us. Sure. So there were a couple logistical questions asked. Um, we, I don't, I don't know if either Lucas or Brian, if you are in a dual degree, I am not in a dual degree program. I, I don't, I think you're shaking your heads now. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about dual degree programs, um, stay tuned for any additional admissions events that are happening. If you're an admitted student, uh, there's a lot of programming that the admissions office offers. And um, those are great ways to get connected with current students. And I think that uh, speaking with a current student is the best way to go about um, really assessing a program. Um, most students who are on these calls are very open and it can feel a little stressful as an applicant to reach out to medical students and you might feel a little like uncomfortable or not sure if you should be like, you know, more professional, but like we have no say over anything. So really like you're gonna get the honest truth from all of us. Um, and we just want you to go where you like want to go. So um, that's just kind of my two cents there. Um, but I responded to a question about opting into staying at NYU for residency, which was um, illustrated in Dean Rivera's presentation. So there's a few different opt-in points. You can probably find a graphic on that. Um, and I wanna go to the question about how we feel about work-life balance and having time to pursue other options. I am part of a different curriculum style than our first year. So I would like to hand it off to you, Lucas and Brian, to kind of talk about how you've been um, balancing this one year preclinical. 
Yeah, I can take the lead on that. Honestly, it's been it's been really manageable. Um, I like that NYU has uh, one exam every two weeks structure, which has actually been really conducive to finding a good balance because it's just I, I know that there's going to be one weekend where I'm going to be I'm going to really focus on studying. But then I know that the weekend after that, I'm going to have more time to do whatever it is that I want to do. Um, and that is a pretty broad consensus amongst the people in our class and other classes that have, that have done the preclinical years already. Um, and even throughout the week, I find that there is time to cook yourself meals. There's time to work out. Um, there's time for clubs in the evenings if you want to participate in that. But it is medical school. So you are going to have to find ways that you are successful in studying like what worked for you in college might not be what works in medical school at least for me it wasn't but you get a hang of it and you might you might have to work harder than you worked before but you find ways to still uh, or at least I've found ways to still work out still try to eat healthy still have time with friends um, regardless of all the studying yeah just to add on to what Lucas said in terms of I think for work-life balance, the predictability uh, is one thing that makes it really conducive and having the ability to plan around uh, your classes and your exams. So, uh, you know, Lucas mentioned the very consistently scheduled uh, exams. I think that's great. I know a lot of my friends here who, you know, they, they've planned out weekends months in advance just because it's cheaper to get tickets that early because they know that that weekend is going to be free uh, and the exams are all um, you know, plan out beforehand. Um, in general, I think having things like uh, online lectures and uh, things that aren't always mandatory for you to go to, it gives you a lot of freedom to study at your own pace and to uh, pull out the time of the day that you work the best and to dedicate some of those other hours to uh, some of your other hobbies. Uh, so for me, I like watching lectures like in the morning, uh, the day after, if that makes sense. Like they 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 have lectures. The Monday lecture, I watch it on Tuesday morning, um, and that usually gives me the afternoon free to do other things, whether it's extracurriculars or going to the gym. Um, so I I like the ability to predict your schedule in some way. Really takes the stress off um, on a daily basis. If that makes sense. Yeah, and as a now post clerkship student, um, the preclinical versus clinical day-to-day uh, -day is very different. And um, it was something that I really looked forward to. Um, I was a little fatigued of being in lectures and I was ready to start interacting with patients. And it's a very busy time. You are essentially you know, in the hospital working and learning as much as you can and then coming home to study um, for your shelf exams, as well as any other activities that you're involved in. Um, but it was a wonderful experience and um, it really helped solidify my interest in pediatrics. And I saw significant growth in who I, who I was as a person and as a professional from my first clerkship in neurology to my last in surgery um, to kind of, you know, illustrate how feasible it is during my clerkship year. Um, just prior to entering my clerkship year and throughout my clerkship year, which spanned from January 2023 to October 2023, um, I along with other members of our LMSA chapter, the Latino Medical Student Association, put together a bid to host the 2024 Northeast Regional Conference at NYU. Um, and this required, uh, you know, creating a presentation and um, speaking with uh, not just our medical school, like, medical uh, education and office of diversity affairs department but we had to connect with our 
you know, CEO and our um, big admin. And we were able to get support and, you know, we're now hosting that conference in just a, a couple months, which is really exciting. Um, so as one of the team members of that team to in bringing the conference to NYU, I was doing that as well as taking care of patients, studying for my exams, uh, practicing for, you know, standardized patient encounters and things like that. So it's certainly feasible um, to continue things that are important to you and that you're passionate about. We have a lot of questions in this chat, and I know a couple of them are more logistical um, in terms of considering financial need during applications. Um, Gene Rivera, do you want to talk about any of those or um, yeah, I could talk maybe hit on that? Uh, just so we don't, uh, we could focus on more, more of the student centric questions. But yeah, so the, um, the applications are considered, they're need blind. Right. It doesn't matter what the need is. It, it matters what's on your application and whatever your need is, we will meet all of that with scholarships. Right. So uh, our scholarships uh, nationally, medical schools provide financial aid to students uh, and typically the following percentages. Uh, on average, they provide financial aid package. I think it's about 74 percent of the financial aid package is given in terms of loans. Um, and you have some 20 some odd percent that are maybe giving in scholarships and the rest are in work state. At NYU Grossman, uh, it's about 94% of our financial aid packages are given out in scholarships uh, and about uh, 7%, 6 7% in, uh, in loans. That's a tiny amount of loans. So that tells you a lot about that. But yeah, it's it's need blind. So um, uh, whatever the need is, we, we will meet there. And then... Um, Something else, were there any other questions? Uh, oh, how many international students? Does NYU medical student meet each year? You know, um, it varies, right? That this year, I think we have, I wanna say, if memory serves, about nine or 10 folks, but those are people we accepted and they have all the tools. So I don't know how many of those are gonna choose us at the end of the day, um, but, uh, but yes, we accept applications from international students, so long as they've done their undergraduate training at a US or Canadian, uh, undergraduate institution. Thank you. Um, Lucas, would you be able to share a bit more about uh, extracurriculars that you're involved in and kind of what your uh, community looks like? And then Brian, can you tell us a bit about um, any community engagement that's non-clinical service or something that um, you really liked about NYU that you discovered or something that was uh, difficult to adjust to? So. Yeah, I'm involved in a couple organizations, uh, being the Plastic Surgery Interest Group, where we kind of talk to uh, physicians at NYU to schedule events so that our students can learn more about the specialty, hopefully engage, uh, whether it's getting to know residents, attendings, um, or just seeing speakers talk about what makes the specialty, uh, what the day-to-day -day of their profession is. I'm also in the Black and Latino Student Association, where we plan uh, events for both uh, students that identify as Black or Hispanic, or, or just the general student body to, sometimes they're just not even related to that, just to spend time together and, uh, enjoy each other's company, but also organize like culturally oriented events. And I'm also an admissions ambassador, which is why I'm here to engage with prospective and admitted students in uh, everything regarding admissions. And they're all really, really great opportunities to, to spend time doing things that I'm interested in. And I do feel like I have a lot of time to uh, to contribute to those organizations in addition to studying and doing research and and shadowing and everything else that is more part of my, of directly what medical school is or what I had in mind coming here. Um, so for me, I forget exactly what the split was supposed to be, but most of my extracurriculars outside of med school um, kind of centers around the research part. Um, and I wanted to jump on that really quickly just because I enjoy doing it. I, I 
in the NTPH program, we do get dedicated time to do research, but I really wanted to keep, you know, uh, my skills sharp, I guess, in, in that part. Um, so I think NYU has, if you're interested in doing clinical research or basic science research, as I'm interested in, there are more ways to get um, involved than there are to, you know, do a lot of other things. It's really easy to reach out to a PI or, or, or um, through many departments as well. I think the one research project I'm on, uh, I was actually shadowing uh, in the, the neurosurgery suite. And, um, I talked to the, the, the surgeon who then put me onto the project. And most of my work is with one of the resident. And he actually works with another PI town at the um, the neuroscience center over near Washington Square Park. So, you know, everyone's really connected and it's it's always very easy to find a way into these research projects, which um, I think is great for, for students starting out. Um, outside of that, uh, like Lucas, I'm the student ambassador and I'm also uh, taking part in a lot of the, um, I think, SOC planning for the MSTP as well uh, and just putting together the programming to uh, learn about incoming med students and uh, to try to convince them to come to NYU. Uh, so I think anything that you're interested in is it's really easy for you to get involved and for you to make a positive impact um, for that thing. Um, so yeah. Well, can I add one? That was thing? great. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so one good way, a uh, really great resource that we have, especially for first year students, uh, to really see what specialties you think you might be interested in is we have a designated shadowing portal where you can sign up to shadow physicians in pretty much any specialty. Um, they 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 give you their schedule or they set out time so you can go and shadow them. And it's really easy. It's really it's a really good way to shadow physicians without having to reach out to them directly, because as we know, physicians are extremely busy. So it's a really good way to just sign up for shadowing. It gives you an information of where to show up when just what to bring and it really makes it a lot more smooth yeah that's it um in terms of community engagement there's so many ways that you can be involved um there's different student organizations that do a lot of service and there's also i mean being in new york city um there's so many things that you can get involved with. There's like a ton of nonprofits, a ton of grassroots organizations. The The city has um, like platforms, like websites and databases that can help direct you to uh, community engagement service opportunities that are not necessarily related to medical school. Um, so that's always an option. One thing that I was involved in was our students teaching about real subjects, which was a student initiative that initially started as a research program, a research project that kind of evolved more into a student group where we went to a local high school um, and taught sex ed for like seven weeks. And that has always had such positive feedback. Um, but there's just so so many ways to get involved with the community it's almost um it, it's harder to not be involved with the community i think than it is to uh find something to do um dean rivera did you have any last words i know we're fast approaching 6 p.m i don't know what time this is supposed to end <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to stay for another uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, if folks uh, would like, uh, you know, like, and our students, if you could stay great, if not, that no worries at all. Um, no, I mean, I, I think you guys uh, pretty much nailed uh, most of the questions that, that folks have asked. Um, you know, I, 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 just a couple points in terms of, you know, hearing Brian's uh, conversations about the MSTP training, for example, if you ask me what I think society's greatest needs are, um, you know, a lot of people talk about primary care docs being our greatest need, and, and we do need more primary care docs. If, you know, if, if you listen to the AAMC's report in terms of the projected physician shortage by 2034, for example, we're supposed to have some 45,000, as much as 45,000 uh, shortage of that for primary care docs. Um, but we actually have a greater need for specialty docs. It's somewhere on the order of about 70,000 specialty docs in the same time. But the, 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 to me, the most pressing issue is something that I haven't heard many people talk about in the Donsky, but that's because this is sciences. 
I think that's what we need most of, right? Um, and when you look at um, what we went through with COVID, right? It's a scientist pretty much has saved our bacon, right? Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, developing the mRNA vaccines. And, and so um, that is, you know, one of many things that we look for. I think there's a question from Daisy. What do you think are the most important qualities that NY Medical School looks for? Right, we, we look at a whole host of things. We look at your academic performance in terms of uh, our sense of how you will be ready to, to hit the ground running with our accelerated curriculum, right? We look at your activities that you've done that, that tells us a lot about your personality traits, right? That is, I think, one of the, the key things that's in our admission secret sauce in terms of putting together the amazing classes that we have. And I, I think um, our, our students touched on the amazing culture that our students have. I, I, I mean, I, I just, I, I, am, I feel very proud of our students. I, I, one of my favorite things to do uh, as an educational team is to go running with students every so often. We go on the track and we do our track workouts there. And it's just, it's just amazing to hear folks' story uh, and what they're, what they're capable of doing both in the hospital and out of the hospital. And I think part of the reason we get such amazing students is because we look very carefully at the extracurricular activities people do and what they tell us about your personality traits what drives you and how you want to change the world, right? And then, of course, broadly speaking, when we're looking at the diversity class, right, we're looking at crafting a physician workforce that will go on to meet the clinical, educational, and uh, research needs of all segments of our patient society. So there's there all those things go into crafting that that class because ultimately, I think the one thing I always emphasize in these talks is. If there's one thing that really differentiates us from other schools, it's an unwavering commitment to excellence in everything we do, right? We, we've created a culture that specifically uh, looks to ensure that everyone who's here, whether you're the dean, whether you're somebody like me, our students, that everyone is, is out there to do the very best at what they can do to take care of patients. So that's that's just what what I would end on. I, you know, I'll, I'll I'll put my email address in the in the box if anybody has any questions. Um, and I'm happy to stay for a couple more minutes if, if people do have more questions. Awesome, thank you, whole NYU team. I will see if anybody else wants to unmute themselves and ask anything. Um, I will stop the recording here just so we can do that. But.